everybody. This is Jason Augustus Newcomb. Once again, we're inside the Magic Circle, and today I am extremely excited to be speaking to a gentleman whose work has really been inspiring to me on a bunch of different levels. Um, I'm speaking to a gentleman named Lionel Snell. You might uh, better know him as Ramsey Dukes, the godfather of the chaos magic movement, and I'm really excited that he's taken some time to speak to me. Thank you so much for being here today. Well, it's my pleasure. Yes. So, um, I like your backdrop, by the way. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, it, <laughs> yeah. it, used, yeah. it used to be a series of pictures, but then I thought, you know, I know how to print these, um, mm. oh, these, yes, uh, yes. These, these colorful banners. I'll, I'll make my background a little bit more interesting, but thank you. I, so I must do better than my kitchen, I think, yes. <laughs> yeah, I see, I see some, uh, some cleaning spray in the background there. <laughs> oh, dear, yeah. <laughs> there, was, there was an author I spoke to um, a few months ago who had a, a snake in the background for quite a bit of the interview, and then his, then his son started running back and forth. So, so <laughs> the, you're, you're in good company for, oh, for having a, all kinds of backgrounds going mm. on. So, um, so I usually like to ask people at the beginning, how, how is it that you became involved in, um, in the occult in the first place? Um, you know, you've obviously, your, your, your first book, I think, is, is uh, SSOTBME, correct? Mm. And yeah. so that was that was in the sort of early 70s that you wrote it. So mm. how does a person in the in the you know 60s or 70s just discover the occult in the first place? Well, actually, I was really, in a sense, always, always interested, you know, and I think many young children are. Mm -hmm. But um, the 1950s was not a very good time to be interested in the occult um, because it was a time of you know, really high skepticism. Um, uh, you know, um, what's it called? you know, logical positivism and, mm. um, and that sort of thing. Uh, my, my family were not against it particularly because actually they were a very unconventional family. My parents had met in a, a sort of woodcraft proto-hippie movement, you know, and so we, we knew people with, with totem names like um, Woodbecker and <laughs> Beaver and things like that, you know. Um, but uh, when I went to school, uh, I got a scholarship from the country to go to a um, boarding school. And, you know, uh, they weren't unsympathetic to my interests. They lent me books by Harry Price and things like that. But really just the whole um, atmosphere was very uh, much against having an interest in the occult or magic. Now, what changed that? Um, one thing was that uh, the school science library had a really brilliant collection of books on alchemy and magic. I mean, really going right back. Um, great glass cabinet full of them. And, you know, there were things like the works of Agrippa and Thomas Vaughan, the alchemist, things like that, uh, leather bound ancient copies. I could take them home in the holidays and read them. And the thing that really struck me was um, there we were being told, you know, that uh, this magic thing was slightly cookie people who, you know, were out of their heads and all that. Mm -hmm. But you read something like Cornelius Agrippa and his observations of what happens um, are very accurate, you know, mm -hmm. what happens when you put water on fire and things like that. And I thought, well, he wasn't out of his mind, you know, he, he was observing as well as any modern scientist what actually happens. So I, I, I got a lot of respect for that. Um, now, the other thing, uh, well, just on the, on the sort of normal books, um, when I, uh, I came across the book of the sacred magic of Abramel in the Mage, because I read a review of it, and this looked like to me like the first sort of serious book um, that magic was real. You know, um, it wasn't any of the sort of eye of Newton, tongue of a hanged man sort of nonsense. It, mm -hmm. was, it was just gave you clear instructions what you're supposed to do. So I sort of thought, well, yeah, this, it's real. I'll do this when I grow up. <laughs> I left it actually much longer than that. But um, so that was a serious book. But then at that time, um, the books that were around were like W.E. Butler and Dan Fortune, who on the whole warned you off Crowley, you know, dangerous stuff. Um, but when I went to Cambridge, uh, they had a big collection of his books and letters from him and things like that. And I found that I really liked his approach um, and well, his many approaches, I should say. And then later I came across with doing Gerald York, I came across Austin Spare. So those were the sort of um, normal influences on me that other magicians have had. But there's one thing which was rather unusual, which I would like to mention. Sure. Because it's different. And that is that um, in about 1970, no, 60, 1960, we had a visit at school from one of the sort of 
pro pioneers of um, artificial intelligence, a man called Professor George. And he spoke to a small group of us, um, uh, sort of sixth form intellectuals, um, about this concept that uh, a computer in the future might actually be able to model a human brain and might actually become conscious. Now, the other people in this small group were mostly um, people from the humanities, you know, English uh, history and that. And they were clearly very threatened by this idea because they were saying things like, surely a computer couldn't fall in love or, or write a poem and so on and so forth. And, um, but I was a mathematician and I looked at it from a very different, from an occultist angle. And where they were seeing, this was the sort of the final juggernaut of reductionist, um, uh, yeah, reductionist yeah. materialism, crushing all the art and life out of, out of us. Um, I saw instead the beginnings of an implosion, a gravitational implosion of um, collapse of the sort of materialist scientific worldview. And um, that was sort of intuitive feeling. But when I thought about it the next day, the first example that occurred to me was reincarnation. Now, see, at that time, reincarnation was considered out of the question because whatever soul was made of, whether it was an electrical thing or chemical or information or a mixture of them, there was no known mechanism where that soul could travel not only through space, but through time to another body. Right. And therefore, rubbish. But what occurred to me is if my consciousness, my soul is made up of information, it doesn't have to travel through time and space. It just has to turn up somewhere else or be replicated somewhere else. Now, the obvious argument against that is, well, this is like, um, you know, a million monkeys typing at random on a million typewriters, you know, would they ever write down the, the works of Shakespeare? Um, so, you know, the chances of that sort of configuration arriving somewhere else were negligible. But the point is, we don't have a million um, monkeys. We've got many billions of monkeys because all the different connections in a single brain and all sure. the things that connect, I'm told, you know, is on a par with the number of um, particles in the universe. Yeah. So we've got a hell of a lot of monkeys on it. And the other thing, it doesn't have to be exact because, one example, I had a dream that Elvis Presley came to visit. We spent an afternoon chatting together. We had a meal together. Now, according to that theory, my mind had made a model of Elvis Presley. But the thing is, that model had passed the Turing test, which in those days was the nearest they could get to sort of a proof of consciousness. I'd spent the whole afternoon talking to him. It never occurred to me that he wasn't the real thing. You see. <laughs> so um, that was interesting. And the other thing was um, my own ex experiments with, um, with uh, past lives. Uh, I remembered several past lives and I remember them not as sort of, you know, uh, seven days a week, 365 days a year, this happened, then this happened, then this happened. I remember them just as sort of very vivid flashbacks to certain places and events and feelings. Sure. Now that actually is how I remember my own past. You know, if you ask me what I, I remember odd bits from my childhood and things like that. Right. So they were in that sense were as real as my own past. And what's more, they had value because those uh, things ex provided explanations of some of the things that were happening to me, um, you know, in my present life. They were as good as going to a, uh, an analyst who took you back to your childhood and said, you're like that because you were the youngest child and that sort of thing. Yeah, so, I've, um, I've actually suggested that's the value of past life uh, hmm. experiences is that ultimately they, they act in a therapeutic way. If you approach them as such, they, they are, you know, they are basically a way of dealing with the the problems that you have in, in now yes, without yeah. having that sort of <laughs> necessary crisis you're looking at some other crisis but it still yeah. manages to sort of <laughs> yeah. remove the the the, the wound up strings mm. in your consciousness so to speak and so, to me that says they're valuable you know you can't right. just say oh they're nonsense um, they're so but but i mean your, your point is that consciousness itself is not a a, a solid object is more like a series of, of sort of strings and things going going uh, around uh, where we have particular events that are important and those shape kind yeah. of our perception of things as they are now but it's much more limited than having to have the entire 
life as a file that that is a discrete yes. thing that you that you have to yeah. carry around it's Absolutely. much smaller than it's that much more fragmentary and there was another um example which is like finding accepting the idea of reductionism but finding it's got a reverse gear and that was this thing where um the sunflower turns to the sun through the day because it loves it now the logical problem is to say, well, that's nonsense. You know, it isn't love. It's just and they'd explain the uh, sort of electrochemical reaction of the sun on the stem and how it makes it turn. All that. And I'd say, but I love the sun. I too turn. You know, I like to <laughs> strip off and lie in the sun. I love it, and I know what that feels like. Um, and the, but you tell me that that actually is an electrochemical thing in my brain. So why can't I call the electrochemical thing in the sunflower sure. love? If, if I experience it as love, we're, and both, basically, we're both the same non entities, so why not use the same terminology? Yes, that's it, yeah. And so that makes it look as though love actually permeates the universe along with um, <laughs> every other feeling, you know. So it's sort of, um, yeah, I was working on those lines. You've made my day. I love that concept, and, and that, that has you, you've already changed my mind. <laughs> no. So, right. uh, so, so, yeah. <laughs> But back to your chronology, you, you're, so you you're, you see this uh, this this person who's, who's an early early AI advocate, and mm -hmm. and that you know starts a bunch of, of sparks flying. How does that further yes. lead you into the occult? Well, it sort of um, uh, to some extent it defined my own path. You know, um, uh, okay, I read theosophy and I read you know, <laughs> other things like that. But I had a particular angle on it in terms of sort of you know, information and how um, this is something all pervading in the universe. And that led to, I don't know if you know my book, um, Words Made Flesh, mm -hmm. where I suggested that, um, you know, we could be living in a virtual universe. Right. Now, what is very special about that is that, um, well, I gave that argument, you know, that people in the 1980s were saying um, that they're looking for theory of everything one set of mathematical equations which actually would unite all of physics you know right. um, both gravitational and quantum physics and that and that matter was completely determined by these equations now the argument i put was well that's a lovely mathematical idea but it isn't science unless you can demonstrate it in some way under controlled conditions and the only way i could see to do that would be to model it in a big computer Okay, and then you can watch and see in the computer if, you know, planets and galaxies form and all that sort of thing. But you couldn't stop it there because people say, but that isn't life. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to do what they're now doing with exoplanets. You would have to look at those planets and scan them for size of life forming. Um, and then when do you stop it? Well, uh, um, until it's intelligent life, the, the Christians will still say, yeah, but God made us <laughs> what we are. Special, um, yeah. And I realized the only way you could, uh, uh, this isn't proof, of course, but the, only, the best you could do is to let it run until the most intelligent beings in this universe themselves worked out the equations their reality was built on and themselves tested it by making a model in a computer and so on. Now, that would mean that if the world is, as the scientists tell us, made up of um, matter uh, obeying certain rules, then it's very unlikely we're living in that world. Right. Because such a world would spawn a whole cascade of virtual universes. And we're far more likely to be in one of those than in the original thing. You see? Right. And the, and the, so, idea, the idea that we're, with the, we're the first of those is completely arrogant and ridiculous. Yes, yes, that's it. You know, it's, it's just on, on a sort of probability argument. It's very, right. very small chance. Um, considering with all the time, this could go on forever, you see. Um, now, the thing is that um, that to me is a magical world because what is the two strongest sort of scientific criticism of the magical idea? One is, might call it orthogonality, of things being totally independent. Mm -hmm. That is, how could the position of Neptune when you were being born have any effect on your life? Neptune's a gas giant, you know, you can't even see it. It's billions of miles away. Right totally independent of your life. And the other is um, chance. If I shuffle a pack of tarot cards, that's a random event. How could that random event have anything to do with my life? Now, those two things, randomness and orthogonality, are natural in a physical world, but they're extremely expensive in an information world. They haven't managed to make a computer produce random numbers. 
you know, it's, it's one of the biggest challenges. Right. They can do, they, what they could do is put pseudo random numbers. Then. And the other thing is, if you're going to have totally independent variables not affecting each other, it would mean many, many parallel processes for every single vehicle, which again is ludicrous. So the information universe would be all part of one system. Um, in other words, it's a magical universe. So yeah. <laughs> Both of those scientific ideas, though, I think are are have been somewhat challenged by by science in the last you know few decades. It, it, um, yeah. The uh, the idea that that things are discrete from one another, I mean, hardly mm. even makes any sense anymore. I mean, the whole the the, mm. the quote unquote Newtonian, which I think is unfortunate since he was an alchemist, but um, the, <laughs> the, the the Newtonian uh, uh, mm. physical laws of the universe seems to to be sort of degrading. Do do you feel like your work has influenced that on some sort of uh, level? Um, uh, at be, least on a magical level, I suppose. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be nice to think that it has actually, because you know the Matrix movie came out about, um, oh, I know, sort of 15, 16 years after I, I, I proposed this. Sure. And, um, and, and resembles think, it quite a bit. <laughs> right? and, and, yeah, and, and gave people the idea, you know, for me, it was just for them, it was just me writing words, but, you know, they sort of experienced right. it in a, in a movie. And just interesting from an astrological point of view that um, Liz Green in about 1980, I wrote a book about the outer planets and their cycles. And she says, when Jupiter comes into Capricorn, um, she associates Capricorn amongst all the obvious things like business and, and this, that, and the other, and um, structures. Um, she associates it with our basic idea of what matter is made of. And so she said that when, Ju um, when Pluto comes into Capricorn, that could begin to erode and really change people's idea of the nature of reality. And that's been, I don't know, what is five years or something that's been happening. It's in, it's in there for a long time, you know, and that is what's going on now. So I think there are sort of many factors. <laughs> I'd like to think that I contributed to it. Well, I, I'm, I'm sure that you did. I mean, uh, you, mm. certainly uh, from a, a magical perspective, you did, of course, right? Because you <laughs> you wrote some things down and, and put some ideas yeah. out in the universe. And mm. since things are connected with one another, certainly your mm. your ideas have, have influenced things. And the, uh, and the thing of cyber magic, you know, so. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, so, so you're you're in that room. You're inspired. What what happens next? Did did, did you meet people doing um, magic? Were you mostly by yourself doing magic for a long time? I was quite a bit by myself because I I lived in fairly deep country. Um, the uh, there was this um, guy. Not there was quite a lot of stuff happening in the area. Um, the, you know the W. B. Butler people and people like that. They had your magic temple at Tewkesbury, which wasn't far from me. Um, I never got involved with them. But there was a book service that I befriended, and he introduced me to um, Gerald York, who, of course, was a Crowley disciple mm, yeah. who actually financed 777. And he, he had the whole collection. You know, he made a magical vow that he would save every uh, Crowley book he could find. And he was the one who lent me the um, Book of Pleasure by Austin Spare. Mm. Uh, and, you know, so. That was a great education for me, uh, magically. Now, meanwhile, um, there was a little magazine appeared from Bath, which wasn't far from me, um, called Agape. Agape number two. And um, it was you know, interesting occult thinking, more, more on my lines. And I was very excited and I visited them and said, I'd like a copy of number one. And they were sort of a bit quiet. <laughs> and then eventually I discovered, People had said you'll never get beyond number one, so they decided to start on number two. <laughs> so there never was a number one. But anyway, when it came to Agave Four, um, I gave them an essay I'd written called Spare Parts, which was a sort of exposition of Austin Spare's Book of Pleasure and its ideas and everything like that, which at the time was the only thing that had been written on that scale about him. And they published it and also published a facsimile of um, my copy of the. Uh, uh, Anathema of Zos. So that magazine went out, just a small publication magazine you know, around, around Britain, and that attracted the attention of the uh, people who were going to become the chaos magicians. You know, I was about like to say, I mean, it seems like it seems like you really birthed that that movement then with that in some ways, sort of reinvigorating uh, Spare's ideas into the world. Yes. And... Well, I certainly contributed to it, and, and Sosopomy itself, S-S-O-T-B-M-E, sort of 
propose a view of magic that wasn't dependent on you know a particular pantheon or particular type of spirit or particular view of what reality was you know and so both those things uh, fed into chaos magic i didn't term, call, coin the phrase you know that was pete carroll who who coined that and um, people like ray sherwin and those who are in the north of england but certainly my ideas um uh Gerald Suster, I don't know if you've come across him. Yeah, he yeah. passed he passed on um, my my SSOT BME to them and showed them and that sort of thing and you know and then it sold in small ways around Britain. So okay, yeah, so I definitely fed into that. I want to I want to um, talk about Sasatbami a, a couple a couple of uh, it, things around it. First of all, um, I, I think it's I think it's a fantastic book. <clears throat> I was I before I'd even. Uh, found you and, and started to schedule this this interview. Mm. I had just recommended it to someone, and I made I made the um, mistake of saying the names of uh, what what those letters stand for. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "Have you ever heard of a, an author called Ramsey Dukes? He's got a great book called uh, Sex Secrets of <laughs> the Black <laughs> Magicians Exposed." And before I could even get any further, they were like, "Oh, I, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't read <laughs> yeah, something like that." <laughs> like, no, it's, you're you're misunderstanding. Yeah. <laughs> so first of all. What what made mm. you choose to have that be the title of it? Um, oh, yeah. And, and well, was it always it, SSOTBME, or was it originally called yes. the full title? Well, the thing was, uh, um, I it was Christopher McIntosh, who's a, a bit of an occult historian. You know, um, he wanted to do a volume about. This was early seventies. There was a lot of sort of interest in things like yoga and Eastern mysticism and things like that. And he wanted to do a, a collection of sort of articles on each of these things. And he said it would be interesting to put in one about Western magic, because you know people would be surprised by that. They hadn't sure. heard of it, something. And he asked me to write a little um, essay on Western magic. And I wrote it, but the book project fell through. So I was left with this little essay. Now, it's actually a very sort of um, early 70s joke, uh, that, because uh, a lot of small publishers were publishing their own books. And, and one person wrote a book about a sort of critical thing about media, about television. And he called it Sex and Television. In other words, it's sort of sending up the trash thing, that sort of thing. It had nothing to do with sex. It was about television, quite an intelligent book. Right. So um, I did have this chapter in it where I say, you know, I've explained magic and it's fairly sensible sounding, isn't it? So why is it people buy books with titles like Sex Secrets of the Black Magicians Exposed? You know? um, and so I thought, well, let's give it that title. <laughs> let's find out that's what it is. So that was it. It was a sort of private joke. You know? That's funny. I, I'd always kind of thought that you were you were writing it from the perspective of um, those sort of uh, early 20th century um, positive thinkers who who say you know oh you yeah. you'll you'll get uh, you know millions of dollars if you just you know use my super secret for <laughs> mind power or whatever you know oh, yeah. um <laughs> well uh, how about how about the later book which was blast your way to megabucks right right no, that, yeah, that, 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 that even more yeah. so yeah <laughs> what All saved that title was the <laughs> subtitle and other reflections upon the spiritual path <laughs> i put that in <laughs> yeah I, mean, I, I love your titles they're 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 so wild and crazy i wonder if there are some people who are more sort of serious and scholarly magicians who actually could use some of the 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 ideas that you have that that, that stay away from them because of that um, but maybe uh, maybe yeah. it's a it's a it's an intelligence gating thing, you know. If you one you're... of the one, one of the big disappointments of my life was an early review Amazon review of um, Blast Your Way to Megabucks. Uh -huh. The person said, "I bought this and it didn't tell you how to blast your way to Megabucks." <laughs> oh, <funny. coughs> yeah. Mm. Well, exactly. That's I mean that's sort of a. Um, so I, I wanted to ask another question about about the, uh, your your early writing career. What made you choose the nom de plume um, Ramsey Dukes? Where did that come from? Yes, I I'm not really sure. It's just um, uh, I tended to write under different names because it sort of detached me a bit from what I'd written. You know, mm -hmm. I could read it and I think, oh. Um, if someone says, "Do you really believe that?" Say, "Words made flesh." You know, Do you really believe it? So, um, I can say, well, no, it's an interesting idea. Um, I don't know if I would try to nail down Richard Dawkins in a chair and persuade him it's true. You know, um, uh, it's sort of um, so it's sort of detached a bit if I, I if I use these different names. 
Now, the thing about Ramsey Dukes was just a happy noise I made one day, leaping up and down, Ramsey Dukes, um, <laughs> where it came from. Um, when I published Thunder Squeak, I broke it down into Ram, which is Aries, my sun sign, uh. C, which is Pisces, where my moon is, where my, my Mars is, so the, the ruler is there, and Dukes is De um, for uh, the Gemini, the twins, where my moon is, you see. Oh, okay. So I, I wrote Ram, C, Dukes, you see. Um, but uh, sometime but was... later, there was um, uh, a Frenchman called Christian Jacques, I think it was, wrote a series of novels based on Ramesses II, um, who re um, sort of brought magic back to, uh, to Egypt after the monotheism of um, whoever it was, uh, you know, the monotheist. And um, I quite identified with what it said, you see. Mm. And I thought, ah, because in French it's Ramses de. Right. D-E-U-X. Oh, that's Ramsey Jukes, you see. Um, now, that was just a sort of private joke until I had my DNA test done by National Geographic to find out, you know, all where my ancestors had come from Africa mm -hmm. and all that sort of thing. And um, discovered that a very, very distant cousin of mine is Ramesses II. Oh, so, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, there yeah, we are. I've got it. I've got it. <laughs> Well, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna um, give give fuel to those who want to just say it's all, it's all just uh, physical objects, since you know your your actual DNA was was informing you rather than something yeah. beyond. That was it, yes. Speaking oh. to me, channeling him. <laughs> so, so you're saying Ramsey Dukes was just sort of a random thing that you chose, and all of those sort of yeah. meanings are things that that coalesced mm -hmm. around it afterwards. Yes. You see, the trouble was I was using different names for different things I wrote, and people yes. say. By then, I actually had some readers. You know, it's very muddling for your readers, you know, that um, come out with a different name every time. And you better stick to something. So I thought, oh, well, I'll stick to Ramsey Jukes, and that, that, that was it. What, what, what are some of the other noms of plumes that you, that you used frequently? Well, I quoted a person called Lemuel Johnston. Right. Um, and his Johnston's paradox was his thing about, you know, that if um, matter is, as the scientists say, that we're not living in that universe. Um, and um, I also... Uh, I ran a, um, a sort of satirical column for a, a small occult magazine called Arrow, which ran for many years from the late 70s and through into the 90s. And it was called The Satanist Diary, written by the Honorable Hugo C. St. John Lestrange. <laughs> um, and in it, there's all sorts of characters. You know, there's Miss Florence Dashwood of the Cheltenham Ladies Liliths Association. There's, um, you know, uh, the very irreverent Dr. Evil Be My Good, a sort of fundamentalist Southern Baptist Satanist and um, an earnest sinner and all these different characters. So they all had their bit writing in this column. Um, so <laughs> there's a lot of names. And actually the title, Blast Your Way to Megabucks, that was one of the books given out free by um, the very irreverent Dr. Evil Be My Good after his <laughs> sermon. <you> see this? So... <laughs> Yeah, so that was so, all so the fantasy world. Yeah, I was going to say you've got quite a developed a, a story around it. My, my <laughs> I admire that. So um, yeah. the uh, before we get, I want to I want to talk to you about some of the ideas that that are that are present mm. in your books, other than Johnson's paradox. Yeah. Um, but mm. but real quick before we get to that, so um, other than sort of theoretical musings on it, what sort of uh, magical work were you engaged in? Were you doing sort of Golden Dawn oriented stuff or witchcraft oriented yes. stuff? Well, um, let me think. Towards the end of the, of the 70s, um, uh, chaos magic was sort of being heard about. Mm -hmm. And there were groups, uh, um, more, rather more, slightly more known New Agey groups, but they were based on the same sort of idea of you know, a fresh start, not mm. be stuck by old dogma and things like that, create your own rituals, things like that. And there was um, a group like that in North London. And I was living just north of North London in those days. And so I joined it and um, uh, we, they had a temple in North London and, um, and uh, what the typical meeting was they'd have an opening ritual, which was formalized. Um, and, you know, I, I played the, the winds, uh, invoking the four quarters, things like that. Um, everyone had their role. And then they would do something sort of free form in the middle of it. Like, what are we going to do next week? Let's do something about the underworld. 
And each person went away and thought of some ritual element or even a poem they could read or something about the underworld. And then you opened the thing and you did these various sort of, you presented these various sort of ritual things and got people to do them. And it was a very, a very lovely thing to be part of. You know, you've you got real sort of, um, you had the creativity of thinking up rituals, things like that. Mm -hmm. And you had the wonderful um, group effect of a group ritual. You know, and the extraordinary thing is we'd come sep for our separate lives together with separate ideas we thought up. And very often they hung together beautifully the way these things do. You know, it's amazing you chose that because that was exactly what I was thinking of for my ritual or something like that. So they certainly sort of meshed together. Very good experience. And from that, um, I did a lot of going to sacred sites in England, like um, going to the fort where... Uh, Down Fortune's Moon Magic uh, and the Sea Priestess. Yeah, Sea Priestess, particularly. Going to that fort, which is a ruined fort on the coast, and lighting fires of Azrael and, and Evoki and things like that. And also um, going to some of the Long, long Barrows, um, West Kennet Long Barrow, and organizing, inventing rituals. The, the West Kennet one was interesting because it had sort of five chambers. And I went there on my own and sat in the various chambers and sort of meditated and got a feel for them. And I decided these five chambers represented um, the five elements and spirit at the top. And there were five of us. So I, what we did for that one, you see, is we took by random thing um, lot, which element we were. And then each person thought of a little ritual for that element. And they set it up in their particular chamber. And then when everyone had set all their things up, you know, bell rings, and we all move around the pentagram to the next thing, which meant each of us had four surprise rituals. They found themselves faced with something and instructions and performed them. And then the bell would ring and you go around to the next one. So, and we all ended up in the thing of spirit, you see. And that was a, that was a beautiful thing. Again, the way it all hung together and the sort of invocation of it. Um, so yeah, a lot of that sort of experimenting. And um, so that really took us through, yes, I'd say in, well into the eighties. And meanwhile, there was a, um, a series of sort of essay clubs that Gerald Seuster started up. One of them called the Society because we could never decide on a name. So it stayed as the Society and uh, people, uh, a lot of sort of occult heavies like um, Elick Howe and um, Francis King and people like that came and gave talks at it, and I, I gave talk. The the um, charlatan the Magus was a talk that I gave at this thing. Now, at one of those meetings, David Rietti said, "I want to restart the OTO in in Britain, and um, uh, would anyone interested uh, come along and arrange a meeting time?" Now, I was interested, but I, I didn't want to be involved in an organization, you know, with all the rules and things like that. So I turned up, but only three people turned up, which is what you needed. You need a secretary, a master, and um, a treasurer. So I got lumbered with being a secretary. And um, as David Rietti, I thought was very perceptive, said, Lionel Snell couldn't organize a piss up at a brewery. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I was there. And so, um, uh, I, so I was in the OTO and I initiated through it um, for quite a way. So I became a fairly senior sort of for Britain um, OTO member. And that was my instruction really in sort of a formal order. Um, I was involved in the OTO as well um, ah, yes. a, a number mm. of years ago. So yeah, yeah. Um, I'm familiar with that, that structure. Oh, yes. So yes. Um, do, do you feel like um, Thelema as a worldview is something that is that, that informs you in a lot of ways? Or? Yeah. Yes, yeah. it does. And you said that right when you say it informs you in a lot of ways. You know, I, I'm not a sort of fundamentalist Thelemite and all mm -hmm. that. And um, uh, in fact, one of the things I wrote about the Book of the Law was that I find it very interesting and it gives me good ideas and all that. But I can't help saying I'd rather like to write my own version of it, you know, with making a few changes here and there. Um, and uh, well, one um, uh, more elderly um, 
OTO person said, well, really, it's an icon. You shouldn't make any changes, you know. And I said, yeah, yeah, I, I wouldn't force them on anyone else, but it's just I find sure. I want to respond to it, you know, and sort of um, shape it slightly. And uh, yeah, so that for me was the sort of formal side. Now, when I did rituals um, with the IOT, they would invite me to Austria to do uh, to their big conferences. Mm -hmm. um, I did some rituals which sort of, but well, they were very much into, you know, dancing in a circle, invoking, you know, and sort of freaking out and that type of thing. I did rituals which incorporated some of the formality of things like the, the, um, the hexagram ritual and things like that, and then ended up with spontaneity. And they said they were very powerful because, and I think I was partly inspired by Crowley's thing of the, what he calls dramatic rituals, mm -hmm. where you have a, a, a ritual which is very carefully rehearsed by everyone. So everyone knows exactly what they got to do and they do it very strictly, except for the climax, which only the main character rehearses and no one else knows what the climax is going to be. And that's a very so powerful thing because it like compresses Everyone's concentrating hard, compressed, um, and then boom, at the end, it breaks out and then you end up with an improvisation. So I did things more like that. And, and the Chaos Magician, while wow, that was really powerful, I liked that combination of something more formal um, and then freaking out at the end. It was um, worked very well. Do you think that's been replicated over time within that movement or, or is that, was that just a, a unique moment that um, you were presenting and they've gone back to just dancing around? Well, I did it for one or two years. Um, I'm sure it has by someone, you know, because uh, they, 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 it's a very experimental crowd. And um, uh, so, yes, I, th I think, yeah, there must be elements of that. I think it's, it's a fairly obvious thing to do, you know, once you've thought of it. It's, um, uh, mm. So I, I want to talk to you about your um, literary output. And, and, and this is, you, mm. you, you're a, a writer who, um, manages to be um, writing within the, the uh, occult world, but presenting a lot of very new ideas within within that. And I think that that's somewhat unique, since because the, because of the nature of the occult, there's a there's a natural looking backward. Yes, um, yeah. Now I know that within you know sort of chaos magic um, writings, you see a bit more of that. But even even within that. Yeah. There, there have come to be some tropes of, of chaos magic, like, you know, mm. the sigilization and, you know, yes, uh, forgetting yeah. and so mm. forth. Um, the, the, so the, even within that world, there's, there's a, it's, a, it's a lot of sort of mimicking of other writers. Yeah. And, and, mm. I, and, I, and I don't mean that as a, as a, a disparagement, mm. it's just no, the nature of no, it's, occult writing yeah. itself, because you are trying to present truth on some level, you end up having mm. to refer back to the past. Yes. You have an interesting thing where right at the beginning of your um, SSOT BME, you quote a, um, a, a theory or, or an, an idea of Lemuel Johnston's as, oh, yes. as sort of the, 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 the backdrop of the thing. So you're, you're mm. theoretically pointing back at something, but actually pointing to yourself. Um, mm. and, you, and you present this, um, this idea of the, of the four um, directions oh, of, yes. of yes. Uh, um, mm. uh, uh, thinking behavior, or, thinking, or, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. yes, and 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 those and those those four directions are are the the magical direction, the religious direction, mm. the artistic direction, and the scientific direction. And um, this mm. was a really mm. interesting um, idea for me to come across many years ago. Um, and and it and it really has. I, I think about it a lot, <laughs> honestly. I think mm. about it a lot when I'm interacting with people on Facebook who are who mm. are you know, have, have very sort of set in stone ideas. And I try and think, is this, is this a magical way of thinking that this person is having, or is this, is this, are they, yeah. are, are they trying to be scientific about magic? I, it, mm. it, 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 I, I often get somewhat um, confused, but describe to me this, this premise, because you'll do it better than I would. So the, right. Well, it's, it's, it's an idea that evolved. Um, and it, so it actually had its origins, so I go back to school, because there was this big thing about the science versus the arts. Mm -hmm. um, two cultures, you see. And at the time, I thought, well, actually, religion is another culture in those sense, another different way of looking at the world, which is sort of, um, which doesn't agree with the others necessarily, but they're complementary. Uh, that was the, the great discovery of it, you see, because at one point it looked as though scientists were saying we shouldn't be teaching these art subjects at university because they got no use, they're not the future. 
and the arts people say, God, these scientists are Philistines. It was opposition. But then his description meant that actually they were seen as compliments. You know, you could be the best scientist in the world, but you could go to the opera and have a bloody good cry. As long as you didn't write it up in your science notes, you know, you keep them separate, but you, it's, it's good for you to have both. And I thought, well, you know, religion's another one like that. And then um, I thought, well, the magical thinking that I see practice in magic groups, things like that, is another whole different way of looking at the world. And it's got a lot in common with art. And one of them is this thing of belief. You know, um, I've written about that, you know, that um, uh, science and religion, beliefs should be proven to you. If it's religion, they must be in the scripture. You know, fairies don't exist because they're not written about in the Bible and, that, um, and, the, and the priest doesn't agree. Um, science, fairies don't exist because they've never been shown in laboratory conditions and they don't fit the things of science. But um, I point out that people say that they believe in equal rights for women, although the evidence for equal rights of women is less than the evidence for fairies. Um, you know, they don't have equal rights. Um, so what do they mean when they say, I believe in it, when they don't believe in fairies? And there's this thing of you give um, a gift of belief to something. So, and it's the same with art. You know, you, you go to a, a play, Shakespeare play, and you don't stand up and say, stop, 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 this is rubbish. You know, these people are actors, this is fake. Um, <laughs> Shakespeare hasn't got these facts right. Uh, you give a gift of sort of acceptance to it, and you can have a great experience. It can teach you things about life. And I say the same thing with a tarot pack. You know, you give it some gift of belief, which might be a very small one, like, well, there's no ancient history of this, but it's just symbols, which are, are subconscious symbols, you know. You give it that belief, and you begin to get good readings. And it's cumulative. The good readings make you believe it more, and so you actually can build up a real practice. And that, to me, is one very important thing about um, magical thinking. The other was um, what I explored in uh, Little Book of Demons, is that to me, magical thinking begins with the thought that mind might live outside my head. And um, I gave that example where I say a little baby begins its life as a scientist looking for repeatable experiments which always work. He bangs his spoon on the table, bang, 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 and everything, the same thing happens. He pushes the spoon to the edge of the table and it drops to the floor every time. So he's learning science, basic science, you know, what you can depend on will always happen every time and other people can see it. But then he has a problem because his mother does come and pick up the spoon and put it back. But after a while, she doesn't do it very well. She gets pissed <laughs> off. And his great breakthrough is to say, what if she's got a mind inside her like I have? Ah, I can understand then. And then from there, what if the dog's got a mind inside herself? Yeah, it seems to get a bit snarly, doesn't it? You know, um, And that extends to the whole idea that um, a tree, you know, how does a tree feel if I hug it? Things like that. Um, uh, and the market trader says something like, you know, or well, the markets are really nervous today. Now, that gives him a real useful understanding of what's happening. He'll make good decisions based on that. But it's just he's putting his mind out and giving the market a mind. You know, you give the weather a mind. And so if there's a sort of a bad pattern in your life, I said, treat it as if it's got a mind. Talk to it. Ask it what use it is. You know, what's it doing in my life, that sort of thing. So that, that to me, those two things are very important for magical thinking. Um, and that shows that actually it's more sophisticated than, than materialist scientific thinking. Because they say that you go from the baby bashing the table and finding what works all the time to this broader understanding that mind might actually exist out there. And then comes artistic thinking and then comes religious thinking, getting more and more abstract. So I see that sort of materialist um, world where there's only objects and actions, nouns and verbs, um, and there's no meaning linking them, there's nothing like that, as a very primitive view. And I know, for instance, my cat has that view. If it wants to leap into a tree, it doesn't pause to meow at the tree to get permission. It doesn't um, sort of reach out to see if the tree is solid or anything. It just leaps in and expects the tree to be there. Um, whereas, on the other hand, if it meets another cat or if it looks at me, you can see it's trying to communicate. It does have some awareness. 
that I'm different from a dead object, you know. So, and then you get, you know, the, the pack thing, which is the religious behavior. Um, uh, dogs in a pack, very powerful. And people get together in a pack, believing something or rallying around a flag or whatever. So I see the sort of very basic materialist view as, as the bottom of the pile. And these other ones rose with greater sophistication of the development of the brain. Um, and so that is one of the things which is unusual because many people think, oh, the last final discovery was that the world is made of solid matter. Whereas it's, it's the most obvious thing that every animal depends on. <laughs> right. What, why do you think that that view has been so pervasive in its control? I mean, obviously I realize religion and uh, ha has an almost equal power in, mm, yes. in the broader sense of, of pack mm. hierarchies and so forth. Yeah. Um, but but the but this the materialist view has has been so dominant for mm. I don't know th three or four hundred years now. Yes, yes. Um, well, why do you why do you think that is when the well, magical point of view is so yeah. useful? <laughs> yes. Well, I describe a sort of evolution. You know, as I say, um, from magic, from scientific thinking, magical thinking, artistic thinking, religious thinking, and then down again, scientific thinking. And I see it as a sort of evolution because science really comes from religious thinking because it must be things that everyone agrees in. You know, it must yeah. be seen by many people. It's not an individual thing, repeatable and that. Um, but uh, the power of it is that it's dumbing down. Now, we all know that's the most powerful thing, thing you could do is to dumb things down, you know, um, uh, Trump. Mm. Um, oh, it Brexit. puts you in control over over everything. You you think you, you are give, in control. You make it into such a simple little thing. You take mm -hmm. the simplest possible version, um, and you make it into a slogan, and everyone believes it. Um, and so this idea that we're just this very basic idea that we're just made of um, solid objects and thing, and all this stuff about meaning, connection, and all that sort of thing is. It's just a fantasy that the brain evolved for survival reasons, things like that. Um, that's a very powerful idea. It's an effective idea. Um, but um, uh, it misses out a whole lot of very interesting things. You know, the others are evolved from it. Now, one example is that, um, as I mentioned in Sosopomy and in various places, is that when you have a very scientific period, it tends to be followed by a magical period. You know, Victorian, the, the height of traditional science really was the Victorian era, middle of the Victorian age, you know, Darwin, um, electricity, mm. all these things. Um, but at the end of the century, you had a magical revival. You had the fin de siècle and the golden dawn and all those things. Um, I said that the 50s was a very, very sort of skeptical, rational time, but it was followed by the 60s and the magical revival. And I've seen the same thing this century. You know, around the early 2000s, um, the sort of thinkers that everyone was quoting were people like Richard Dawkins and the rationalists. Very powerful movement. Everyone was, so, that's, you know, and there's, the newspaper was very scornful about anything new age or spirit or magic. That's a weirdo stuff, you know, woo woo. Um, but now there's a much bigger interest in all that. And even universities are beginning to study esotericism. Sure. So, and, and then, of course, a bigger example I gave was... Um, uh, the Greek era, or what they call the Axial Age, because it wasn't just in Greece, it was in China and India too. Mm -hmm. A very, very rational 500 years where sort of rationalism was and human, humanism was a dominant sort of philosophy. But it was followed by the Roman era. And uh, for instance, what was quite an accurate, um, carefully measured experimental metallurgy that developed into alchemy. You know, it wasn't the other way around. It wasn't alchemy sort of cleaned itself up and became chemistry. Um, there was chemistry, but it developed into alchemy. There was astronomy, people taking careful measurements of planets, and it developed into astrology. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the Greek medicine was, um, you know, a very rational sort of thing where you didn't actually talk to the person. You just looked at the symptoms because they say talking to people, that's mumbo jumbo. You know, it, it's magical stuff that you just look at the symptoms and you make a diagnosis. And out of that grew the um, wonderful healing temples that the Romans had, you know, which, which, which were really holistic. 
studied your dreams, acted out dramas, got fit, healthy, splashed in water, did everything, you know, like a modern spa. It's, um, so, yeah, I just um, am aware that uh, um, science gives a very uh, dumbed down version of the universe and it has all the power of being dumbed down. Um, you know, it's, uh, yes, it's effective in the world. And very often, if you want to be effective in the world, you don't give them a complicated story. You give them something simple, like we'll make America great or, or whatever like that. And that's what gets the men momentum. Even the concept that you mentioned earlier of, of wanting to have a, a formula that, that explains the whole universe, even if that formula mm. is quite complex, that's a very that's a very simplified thing. You can if you can yeah. you can take the entire universe and everything in it and bring it down to something yeah. you could fit on a page. Yes. That's a sheet of paper. Yes, that's yeah. it. Yes. That's it. So yeah. Pretty reduced mm. at that point. So yeah. uh, so what we, we've talked a lot about ideas, and um, I, I would love to talk more with you about um, the the that 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 um, compass. Uh, Mm. <clears throat> but I, I don't I, I, I want to cover other things too so maybe yeah. we can have another yeah. a conversation mm. specifically about that tonight in the future but oh, yes. um, mm. where what how, you have a you have a particular view of magical thinking and ma and ma you know mm. in the magical sort of um, mm. direction but what what do you personally feel is happening there what's your sort of uh, model of how magic works mm. um well, I'm, you could say, a certain amount of agnostic, which is a very chaos magic thing, because uh, we inherit from science this passion with what is true. Um, and um, so, oh, that's an interesting idea that we're living in a virtual reality. Do you really believe it? You know, um, is that the truth? And I say, I don't know, um, but it's a useful model. And if you cannot see how magic could work, if you think of a virtual reality universe, you begin to see how it might work, you know, and that's an important step forward. So, so I see this sort of utility of um, uh, using certain models, but that truth thing is really, it's interesting, but it's not actually very magical. Um, and uh, one example you might say, ah, but if I, um, get a, a Goetic grimoire and I read all the instructions and I do exactly what it says very carefully and I do it in front of cameras with um, objective witnesses watching around the circle and all that and if it doesn't work does that prove that magic is rubbish it doesn't work and I say no this is a rather unpopular answer magic works by definition if the science science master takes a glass of what looks like water puts another bit of water in it and it all goes black people say wow that's magic now if it didn't happen they wouldn't say that something that works is by nature magic so if this experiment doesn't work does it mean that magic's been disproved no it means the magic wasn't there and i suggest the reason it wasn't there is because you actually having objective witnesses and cameras, and things like that, that's a banishing ritual. Sure. It's the thing that science does to get rid of magic. Um, so, you know, it's sort of, it's, it's like trying to invoke, invoke Satan in, in a cathedral. You know, it's sort of, there's a built-in um, built <laughs> paradox there. <laughs> You're asking for trouble. <laughs> hmm. So, so would you say then you don't you don't actually have any hard and fast beliefs about anything? It's more that you you see you see things as being a series of useful models mm. for for having events happen. Yes, I think that um you know I do have sort of bedrock things which I I like like to believe. Like I do tend to believe in reincarnation because I can't see sort of why something as valuable as a soul should just be wasted. You know, on the whole, nature recycles things, so it makes sense to me that you know that. So and so, um, but again, I wouldn't. I wouldn't sort of, as I say, I wouldn't tie down Richard Dawkins to a chair and and persuade him. You know, <laughs> he's got to believe this. I just well, put my uh, view on it. I mean, it, it seems like Richard Dawkins would would be unpersuadable. Anyway, here's my kitty. Yes, yes. Oh, you've got a wonderful fur presence behind she's, you. Yeah. She's been paying like a lot what? of visits during these interviews. People are. Her name is. Her name is Chloe, by the way. My my daughter oh, named hi, her. Hi, Chloe. Yeah. <laughs> 
I've oh, never introduced her, although she's this is yeah. like the fourth interview that she's decided <laughs> yeah. to, to visit. And she's yet to tear down these tapestries, even though she definitely yeah. wants to. You can see it on her face. Yes. Oh, I can see her getting interested. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of these days will come down during an interview. But mm. um, so anyway, uh, the mm. I mean, R Richard Dawkins is unpersuadable because his perspective is actually a religious perspective that there yes. that, that there is no truth to any of this stuff. So even I mean, there mm. there are there are multiple um, you know, sort of skeptical thinkers who've basically said at this point, in in all rational terms, psychic abilities have been proven. There's 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 an abundance of evidence more than there is for for many other things that we consider to be um, scientifically true. But because it's psychic powers, that's not enough. So I mean, yes, I mean, there, yeah. there literally would never be enough evidence. You could yeah. you could bring a leprechaun into the room and put it on mm. Richard Dawkins' lap, and he would yeah. still say that 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 obviously yes, isn't real. Yes. I mean, uh, um, an example of that, of, of as I say, this dumbing down effect of the materialist view, and I, and I say that it, it isn't, it isn't equal to the scientific view because scientists who are not being watched, you know, they they're quite speculative about what is the nature of reality and is it mm -hmm. consciousness and things like that. But um, if you had the sort of say the typical hospital test of a of a, a new drug, sort of you know, double blind test, you know, and all that sort of thing. And it was all being thousand people and it's being planned by a small group of um, testers. And one of them says, well, while we've got all these people, let's take a look at their moon signs just to see if there's any correlation. Um, now that is a very easy experiment to do. <laughs> you could just find out their moon signs and see if there's any difference sure. in the reaction. But people would say, no, no, we can't do that. It will never get published in The Lancet if we do something like that. <laughs> um, so the materialist view is telling people what not to look at. Right. Now, many people talk about a golden age of science, which was, you know, sort of Victorian times when um, electricity was discovered, you know, the roots of, um, uh, of uh, the lack of luminiferous ether and, you know, the wave particle theory and all these things had their birth at that time. It was a much bigger advances were being made in science, you know, than the little things which people are doing now in many cases. So it was a, it was a golden age. And at that time, they would look at anything. They looked at phrenology. Um, they looked at life after death, sure. all sorts of things. Most of them, they decided there wasn't anything in it, but they were open to trying all these things. Whereas now you've got this sort of, um, as you say, a religious mindset, which oh, we can't mention that in this paper because otherwise it will never get published. You know, or they'll think we're dotty. We even thought about doing that. It's a, it's a very um, sort of yeah, dumbing down, put the brakes on, um, keep it simple. Um, Let's make science great. You know, <laughs> let's not actually experiment anything too much. Mm. Mm. So, do you, do you think that that's going to shift over time? It seems like there are a number of writers who are who are leaning away from that at this point, who are getting yes. some traction yes. in, in in popular culture anyway. Mm. Um, or, or do you think I that? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 mm. I, I, you know, there's um, uh, say. Richard Dawkins and um, those skeptics were such a big thing for the first decade of this of this century, mm -hmm. and you know you don't hear much about them now, and it's sort of it's fizzled rather. And on the other hand, there's much more interest in um, alternative ideas now. And uh, <laughs> she's wrestling with your, <laughs> your 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 metaphor has become reality now. The cat the cat is now yeah. wanting to interact with every part of this. Oh, yes, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Uh, I, Unfortunately, considering me an object and sticking her claws into me as well. Yes, that's, yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, I don't have much life in me. Um, mm. So, <laughs> so mm. uh, in terms of sort of the the um, the mechanics of magic, you you wrote it. You mm. created an interesting online course um, called "How to See Fairies" and then uh, oh, published yes. it as a book. Um, and, yeah. and I, I, I think it's very, it, it, it was a really good book and, and um, actually uh, contained some things that I was already doing. And I thought, oh, that's really interesting that he's, that he's, uh, <laughs> that he's really this, but, but both, uh, a lot of your, your writing seem to um, expect a sort of a, a skeptical scientific audience or a, a, mm -hmm. a, a somewhat of an outsider audience. And, and you are, and you are letting them in, in a very mm -hmm. intellectual way. Um, mm. You know, so, so you're sort of helping them to move towards a yes. more more yeah. magical way of looking at things while expecting. Mm. Do, do you think that that's that that's just um, uh, 
an, an artifact of your own sort of uh, entry mm. into the world? Or do you think that that's no, a, almost a no. necessary? Um... Yes, I think it's you see that um, uh, many people want to believe in magic. You know, they like the idea. They want something bigger. They want sort of, you know, in other words, they're, they're moving from the scientific worldview. They're wanting something sure. moves on Probably. with yeah. his mind out there, you know. Um, but uh, they don't realize the extent which they're held back by um, the ideas they've inherited from religion and science. So, um, for instance, this thing, you know, um, do you, it's one thing to believe, but do you really believe in that? Um, they're like putting the brakes on, you know. Um, uh, sure. And, I, and in um, How to See Fairies, I'm, I particularly emphasize this thing. Um, you put the dagger of reason aside, but you're not getting rid of it. What you do is you collect your results, as it were, in the cup, collect what happens, collect the things, experiences. And then when you've got them, you then use the dagger to say which of these are good, which of these are helpful, and all that type of thing. So it's a question of the analysis should really come after you've got results. Whereas the thing I've been describing, you know, the, um, like the experiment where they don't look at the moon signs, they're using the analysis to stop you looking. Right. Rather than get something and then, and then decide whether. It's a, so um, that's that's really why it's so negative. Um, but it's 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 instinctive in many people. Um, a sort of uh, a tendency that, yeah, it, it's ingrained the idea that the real thing is the solid world and that. I give an example of someone, you know, might take up magic because he's never getting accepted for interviews, job interviews. So he does a magic spell because he's noticed that the people who get accepted wear Savile Row suits. So he thinks, right, I'm going to get enough money to buy myself a Savile Row suit. And so he does the spell and he gets enough money, he buys a Savile Row suit. Now, the reason he wasn't getting those interviews is because he was a bit of a prat. Um, so when he goes to his next interview, he might be a prat in a Savile Row suit and still doesn't get the, jo the job. Um, uh, because he's only thinking in terms of, I get this material thing and that's the answer. Right. Because actually what he should really be doing is getting something magical and treating it magically. He gets his Savile Row suit, instead of just putting on and say, right, now I'm going to get a job, he should treat it as a magical vestment. This is my robe of power, which will make me into a great businessman, that sort of thing. You know, get the magic into it um, and go forth in that spirit for your next job interview. <laughs> and you've got to met the magic might work in that case, because you're um, not just depending on a piece of cloth, you're actually it's changing you. You're allowing yourself to change, which is people are a bit sort of shy of doing that. You know, they think, oh, uh, if I get the right talisman, that'll do the trick, won't it? You know. Um, mm. So uh, this is a bit late in the interview to be saying this, but like, can you define what you mean by the 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 magic being set? You, you, you the idea of the magic seemed um, clear to me, but but I feel like. As you're saying it, I'm realizing that that it's it's an in, it's an undefined term in in a lot of ways. Yes. So so what yes. do you mean by the magic being in the consciousness rather than in the material object? That um, it's I'm not very good at definitions. I tend to work with things you can recognize. Mm. Now I would say that um, if uh, you just got a suit and put it on, thinking that because I've got a suit, I'm going to get this job. You are, um, again, you're dumbing it down, really. Mm -hmm. Are people that stupid? They'd only give someone, someone a suit. Whereas if you uh, look at the people who wear these suits, and maybe some of them feel very proud of their rich suits, and you know it makes them feel like real men and all that sort of thing. Well, if you can invoke that sort of thing, change in you, and let the suit um, be part of a bigger magical thing, which is I'm changing myself, you know, I'm becoming, I'm taking, uh, Dan Fortune calls it taking on the magical personality, I think. Um, you know, when I put this suit on, I'm not that prat. I'm, you know, um, I'm the person I want to be, if you like. Um, uh, then you're sort of um, bringing magical power into it. Uh, and what I've often arguing in Going back to your earlier question, I'm arguing is that um, uh, 
a lot of successful magic is actually giving it permission to happen. Um, if you get your good tarot reading, and then you think about it, you say, well, it could just be a coincidence or, you know, um, yeah, someone said something like that the other day. It's probably my unconscious coughed it up. You know, you start um, eroding the magic and all that. Um, you're, you're losing it. Whereas if you can accept that something wonderful has happened and, um, you know, embrace it, allow it to be the real thing, then you are, um, yeah, you're opening up. And that's similar in a way to art uh, that um, uh, I remember an art master when I was teaching was very impressed because he'd given a number of boys um, to, to draw a picture of a chair, which was a, one of these chrome tube chairs. And most of them sort of went around the outline of the chrome. There we are, um, there's the seat. But one of them looked at the reflections in the mirror pipes, you know, the shiny pipes, mm -hmm. and started trying to draw those reflections. He was actually recording what his eye was seeing, not a knowledge of a chair was shaped like that, and therefore I must begin with that. Um, and the person said he wasn't very good at it, but he said, now that is artistic thinking. He's actually uh, putting aside all the sort of knowledge of what it ought to be like as a chair, and saying, what am I actually experiencing? And going into that experience. And that's sort of, you know, it's more like what it's about. Um, do so, an interesting tarot reading and you say, why is it interesting? What is it that touches me in that? You know, let's go deeper into that. It's sort of, it's, it's again, giving it a mind, make it come alive, not just a set of cards, which um, are symbols. Would you say that the, the, the magic for you is similar to the definition of uh, synchronicity that, that is often thrown out there and, you know, sort of an a-causal connecting oh, yes. stuff yeah. that, that, that it's not about the discrete things, but more about the whole sort of field of stuff interacting? Yes. I think that um, uh, I wouldn't equate them, but it's, you see, magic opens up opens you up to that recognition. Um, uh, do you ever see the thing, uh, oh, what was it called? There was a program about this group of people who go in search, a quest to sort of, um, it's named after a, a town they went to. Uh, it was on, uh, oh, what's it called? Um, yes, uh, the, the sort of thing is they, um, they got this clues that there was something important in this area. And they, they went and then and there was one of them would sort of go into a trance and um, uh, they'd ask, they asked some questions and he said, you know, sort of very vague woolly things. And he said, I can see a tin can. Um, and he emphasizes, yes, yeah, a tin can, definitely. Now, they next day they went exploring, they went into a, a tunnel, an old deserted mine shaft. And it was all like quite creepy, you know, and they're looking for signs, that sort of thing. And then they saw a tin can. And the guy said, wow, that's amazing. That is just what I was seeing. Now, a skeptic would say, well, you know, what old mine shaft doesn't have a few old tin cans and bottles around? Come on, you know. <laughs> but um, you see, in that story, if I say it like that, I've missed out one thing. And it was the biggest thing there, which is the sense of awe that he felt. He felt very strongly, there's a link here. Um, now he was the one who felt that. And you see, so in a sense, he was, that is the important thing in that story, mm -hmm. that he found a connection between his, um, uh, his vision and uh, when they went into that cave, that links it up. So it's just a synchronicity in, in this sort of um, coincidence type of mindset. But I say that that sense of significance and awe I think is actually a very important part. It's part of that um, software of the universe, which is um, you know, behind things. So um, one of the things that's really um, growing in popularity in the occult movement today is um, sort of working with spirits and working with spirits in 
a devotional mm. way and leaving offerings for spirits and, and oh, yes, um, yes. taking on a very sort of um, uh, a model of the universe that's based on, you know, different levels of intelligences and mm. working with those as uh, discrete entities. Mm. Where does that fit in with your sort of thinking on magic? Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, um, the various angles on that. One is this idea of the hierarchy, the you know, traditional idea that you have um, the demon of something, you have the angel of it, you have the archangel, all that. Well, that's very like um, software might be arranged. You know, um, uh, uh, you know, um, there's the vegetable kingdom, there's the animal kingdom, and there's the insect kingdom. And within the vegetable kingdom, there are the grasses, the trees, things like that. You know, and then within so you have like, as it were, the god of vegetation. Then you have the, the god of grass and the god of trees, things like that. And then below that, you have the angels of each of the different things. And then you have the demons of a particular tree, its spirit, you know, things like that. So it sort of fits very well, the idea of a sort of um, software hierarchy. Uh, and it's just, we know them as spirits, um, angels, archangels, gods, things like that. So that that's aspect of it, just sort of, it's quite neat that you know so uh i can go along with that for that reason but um uh more realistically um it's again this thing of recognizing allowing intelligence to be outside my head mm -hmm. i am um, in my old age i'm forgetful and absent-minded and so um i have a servitor uh in the chaos magic sense who's a butler, who reminds me to do things. Now, I had an interesting conversation with some people a few years back who said, oh, yes, you know, there's this thing called life hacking, where, you know, you, you want to remember to go running in the morning. So you put out your running clothes and ask them to remind you to go running. And I said, that's neat. That's, that's it. Um, the only thing is, I bet people don't do that for very long. It'll be a craze and it'll pass. And I said, the reason is they don't really form a relationship. Do they thank the running clothes for reminding them the next day? I bet they don't. Um, now, they're treating it like an object, you see. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if you asked a friend to remind you to go running, would you just say, thank you, and go off running? No, you would say, oh, hi, how are you? You know, yeah, it's really great. Um, so I'd say you go further than that. You should say to your running shorts, um, hey, thank you for reminding me. That's really great. I'm really looking forward to our next run together. In other words, start building a relationship, treat with respect, and it'll come to life much more. You'll begin to have a sort of, you know, a real relationship there by treating it as though um, giving it the, the gift of mind. Um, so similarly with my, my butler, it's very tempting for me when I remember to take my keys before I go into the car say hey, thanks thanks for that um mm -hmm. but uh, i also if i'm setting down to, to a very nice meal inside my head i don't want people to think i'm balmy i'll say hey i'm going to eat really lovely prawns here you know <laughs> come and enjoy them with me and things like that i sort of um nourish it uh, uh, and it's it's very good that I use it all the time. So that's that's an example of how um, uh, it sounds very naive to treat some phenomenon like um, running clothes or uh, uh, your memory as though it was an, another intelligence. But it's something that works rather well. And you're again, it's this thing you're really allowing it to be a friend. Um, you're not forcing it to being a friend. You're making friends with whatever it is that you use to remind you and things like that. And it brings it to life. And uh, my feeling is that life is actually, uh, the true picture of life is that one of a connected wholeness where everything is connected with everything else. You know, if you take um, a psychedelic drug, you're suddenly in a world of sort of flowing this, that, and the other, and you know, and everything's linked to things like that. And people suggest that that's because the psychedelic drug has scrambled your brains and, and given you, so imported something silly into your head. I say, no, I think it's turned off the interface. 
turns off that solid object interface, which is really a sort of sensory user interface, which sure. says there are only solid objects like that. And you're seeing the sort of meanings behind in all that. And I've explained somewhere, I said, you can see the survival value in that. Because if you go into a dangerous situation and you're high on acid, um, you might just sort of dig the danger. You know, and sort of, you know, whereas if you, know, it, you, you step out of your car and there's a tiger comes out, out of the savannah towards you, um, your sensory user interface says, tiger danger, car safety, vroom, and you're back into it, rather than, wow, dig that menace, you know, and wow, isn't this incredible, and that sort of thing. You know, a car is like mother of the womb, ready there for me, and that sort of thing. By that time, you'll be eaten. But um, so it, it's, um, it's a very simple, dumbed down view of the world, which is so fundamental because it's so safe and so protective. But it's very good to get beyond it and to explore further and begin to find the, these synchronicities, these uh, in significant things in the world. Have um, uh, uh, drugs and you know, entheogenic exploration, is that something that's been a significant part of your, your work in your life or no? Not very much. I haven't done it much. Um, I had a lovely experience with psilocybin. And um, uh, it was a time when my life was so boring that, you know, I dreaded Friday because it brought me closer to Monday and my nine to five job. Mm -hmm. you know, it was that bad. Uh, and I couldn't enjoy any holiday. I'd go to some lovely place for a week. And I'd be thinking, oh, three days to go, oh, two days to go, oh, one day to go. Oh, God, you know, I wasn't enjoying it. But I took psilocybin and for a whole day, I had most wonderful experience. And it was a complete holiday. I wasn't thinking about Monday or the fact it was going to end. I was really there. Now, I didn't, for that reason, I didn't need to take it again because it had taught me something which was so precious that um, forevermore, I knew it was possible to have a real holiday, even in the most boring sort of timetable, <laughs> schedule. And that was very valuable. And I, I gave a talk recently about cults. And I think that the, the, part of the trouble with cults, they can give you fantastic experiences. But for many people, um, what I suggest is they should think, what would happen if this stopped tomorrow? If suddenly the cult was abandoned or my family got cult people to deprogram me and took me away, would I go back a broken person saying, you know, oh dear, back to the boring old world and, you know, uh, I, I can't do that wonderful thing anymore? Or do I go back strengthened? I'm going back to the boring old world that I ran away from, but actually I'm going back with a knowledge of my own joy, you know, th that I'm capable of love and friendship and all those things. Mm. Can I take that gift back and sort of bring my old life back to life with, with this gift I've got in me now? And that's the sort of, to me, that was one of the differences between a, a magical and a religious experience. Can you take something of the great religious event, you know, great religious experience, take it inside yourself, and then you've got something to give the world um, to pass it on. Um, whereas if you find you just can't face doing without it, then really you're an addict, you know, you, you, you haven't grown. <laughs> so so are, you, are, you, are you suggesting that religion is, a, is an, a, an addiction, where, <laughs> whereas magic is a... Yeah, it is for, some, it is for a, some people, yes, a, that's it, you know. Of... Yeah, the only time I feel real is when I'm singing hymns in the great church and that sort of thing and all that, you know, and, and particularly when it's a cult, because the cults I talked about, you know, are the ones which uh, on Netflix they gave programs about, Mm -hmm. And very often it was um, this thing happened where people say, you know, my old life was so gray and drab, you know, now I'm so alive, you know, um, uh, my life has got meaning now and all that. Mm -hmm. um, and then they find out the, club is, the, the cult is kinky or, you know, or it's um, the guy's paranoid who's running it or something like that. And it gets broken up. And many of them said the same thing. They, they just they couldn't adjust to ordinary life after that. Mm. You know, um, it took them a long time to sort of deprogram themselves, just like coming off a drug. Yeah. And I, I gave an interesting example in the, in the last lecture I gave on that. Um, there's a book by Karen Armstrong called Through the Hidden Gate or something like that, where she becomes a nun in the 60s, I think it was. 
and it's very like a cult experience. You know, they really sort of um, ground her down and you know destroyed her ego and all that sort of thing, made her almost like this machine. And she went along with it and, and, and got a lot from it. But there came a point where she decided she, it wasn't really for her. Um, she was going to leave. And she found just the same thing. Going back into the real world was really difficult, you know. Um, uh, and to that extent, she was addicted to the nun's life for all its difficulties, all its tribulations. Um, and, uh, you know, addiction isn't the end of the world. If you can rehabilitate, then you've had an experience that many other people have never had. But sure. um, uh, it's a hell of an experience coming out of it. You know? mm. So uh, I'm going to I'm going to wrap things up because uh, we're, we're, we're getting on past uh, the amount of time that I promise. <laughs> so, right. uh, yeah. so uh, one final question, which is if you if you're giving advice and, and perhaps you have done this before uh, to a young person who's just getting involved in, in an exploration of magic, what would be like the, the, the main thrust of what you would what you would encourage them to do? As they're yeah. as they're getting started, in order to most fruitfully enter this yeah. life. Well, um, I think uh, it sounds a bit corny to say recommend my books, but um, <laughs> you know, if um, for many people they've got a very sort of far-fetched idea of what magic's going to do for them, like you know, give me the money to get the suit to get the job, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. I would say they should open their minds up and see a bigger picture than that. And my books will help them. If they're desperately frustrated by the materialist worldview and they want something bigger and better, um, the value of my books is that um, they take you on the whole from ordinary life. You know, you can open magic books which say, you know, there are seven spheres of the universe and there are archons of angels, things like that, and all that sort of stuff. That's lovely, you know. But wow, where are they? You know, um, uh, it's a big, huge jump for the mind. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I tend to look at some really sort of trivial little thing in life, like you know, uh, the book of little book of demons. You know, why is it we can put imagine a mind in a photocopier and say, why does the bloody thing break down just when I'm in such a hurry? You know, um, uh, and start from something very simple like that and show that actually it's quite a profound thing that your mind is doing and sort of opening up now just say if someone is desperately trying to get away from the, the materialist worldview uh it's a, it's very magnetic it'll pull them back it's got a lot of gravity to it whereas if they can see that there really are little things that happen in everyday life like um suddenly a cloud looks like your old grandfather or something, you know, <laughs> and that rather than saying, oh, that's a coincidence, if you still say, that's interesting, I wonder if grandfather's trying to contact me, you know, if, if you sort of open up to the possibilities, then you're entering a much more interesting world. And as you get used to that world, more and more interesting things can happen. Um, and, you know, that is uh, my approach. And I say, I draw this analogy, it's a bit like some books are like taking an aeroplane to another land. You know, I read this book and wow, suddenly I'm in the jungles of Borneo and, you know, and there's weird things and all that. Fantastic. But when I put the book down, I'm back in London, you know, and uh, it's raining. Um, whereas my books are rather more, okay, there you are in London, it's raining, but let's open a window and you can get a far view there. That's interesting. You know, perhaps there's more out there than you think. And so it's, it's so in that way, it's, it's quite a good approach. And I think it's a very useful one for a lot of people. Um, other things, well, it'd be nice to say uh, it'd be good to join a group, but um, there's all the snags of cultishness if you do that. Uh, so you really want to go in with your eyes open. Um, what Am I really getting out of this group and what I'm putting into it? Um, uh, you know, is it enlarging me and my life? Or is it just giving me weird experiences, which, you know, um, I can't live without? So, yes, finding a good group of like minds is quite an important thing. Now, as as I'm out of touch. I'm out of touch, but you obviously finding things on the Internet which speak to you is obviously a thing one, one should try to do. Um, 
Uh, but uh, you know, I, I can't make recommendations about that because <laughs> <laughs> it's your your channel. <laughs> you you brought up the subject of your book. So, which one of your books would you recommend that new person start out with? I think um, if they are wanting to do something, um, I would say how to see fairies. You know, little experiments you could do and things like that, and it gradually open up and sort of find that you could do things which you thought only experts, clairvoyants um, could do. You're beginning to experience that. If they're coming from the point of view of um, how can magic, where can it be? You know, we know so much about the world and science and all that sort of thing. Um, is it totally lunatic? Then I'd say something more like SSOT BME or for someone who goes to greater depth to look what I did in my, you know, um, uh, my years of magical thinking. Um, but SSOT BME is the one most people gravitate towards. It sort of shows that there is room for magic in the world, which many people think there isn't room for magic, you know. So those I'd think of as the two. Uh, others a bit more, well, a little book of demons. Um, if you have life problems and you're looking for a new way of addressing them, um, which, which actually does the same thing as bell book and candle and, and invoking in a circle um but you sort of invoke in your own mind and get to talk to this demon you know uh, uh, that, that's a, a useful book for that <laughs>